murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat at the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted and her daughter was healed at that moment. This is the gospel of God. Thanks, Jerry. Let's pray for Craig as he comes to unpack God's word with us this morning. Lord, thank you for your word long written down. We pray that you make it real and live for us this morning. For our good and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Come up, Craig. Thank you. Well, let me add my welcome to Ben's, though uh, I feel still like I'm being welcomed myself only three weeks in. Um, but good morning. And uh, if you don't know who I am, as Ben said, I'm, I'm Craig and I'm pretty new here. Um, but if you've got a Bible on your phone or you brought one with you, um, you don't need it, but you might find it helpful to, to have that open so you can follow along with me as we look at this passage. Um, and Ben has stolen the clicker. I can, uh... there we go. So the, the question I just want to ask at the beginning of this is, how mindful are you of your heart? How mindful are you of your heart? When was the last time you stopped and reflected, thought about yourself, your life, and where you are? The last time you didn't have stuff coming into your senses, um, the, the TV and he your headphones, adverts everywhere, maybe reading articles or on social media. How often, how often do you pause and let yourself kind of hear your own thoughts, consider who you are and where you are in life. If you're anything like me, and um, that's not as often as you would like. I mean, even every day, well, not every day, I don't take the dog for a walk every day, but every day that I do take the dog for a walk, it is normal for me to grab my headphones, shove them in my ears, and I'll listen to the, the news or a podcast, just more content coming in. And in the Bible today, we are looking at kind of two scenes, um, one with a group of people who could maybe do with pausing and considering their hearts, and the other with a woman who knows her heart very well. And so if you are ever reading or listening to the Bible and, you're, and you want to know what is God saying here, or well, one of the most important questions you should ask is, why did the writer include this? Why did Matthew include these two scenes? I mean, he, he didn't write every single moment of Jesus' life. That would take up bookshelves upon bookshelves. But he chose what to include here in Matthew 15. And in this first scene, he wants to say to the Jewish people, you're missing the point. And if you keep missing the point, well, you're going to be in big danger. And then in the second scene, he shows us where our focus should be. So let's take a look at that first scene where we see that fixing the outside won't fix our hearts. That's in verses 10 to 20, if you're following along, that fixing the outside won't fix our hearts. This chapter, and just before our reading, it began with a challenge to Jesus. And the Pharisees asked him, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Why are they 
not doing this um, special kind of ceremonial ritualistic hand washing, not just normal going to the sink, but why aren't they doing this special hand washing before they eat? Because you see that devout Jews, um, and the Pharisees would obviously be um, some of the most devout, they loved God's law. And that's a good thing. They wanted to keep it and not make any mistakes. And so over the years, these traditions kind of came about that were rules to help keep God's law. They were kind of like fences around fences. And so these devout Jews, they were really concerned that nothing that was considered unclean by God's law should enter the mouth. And so they added this extra hand washing rules to make sure there was no kind of cross contamination, just to be doubly sure. And so this is what Jesus is talking about when we get to verse 10. Verse 10 that says, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen and understand what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. And then the disciples came to him and asked, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? And we shouldn't be surprised they're offended. This is shocking to them. It goes completely against the way that they have been trying to keep right with God for years and years. When even the disciples didn't understand, Peter says, explain this parable to us. And Jesus says, are you still so dull? You know, it's so ingrained in the Jewish culture so that the disciples, well, they want to keep the rules. They just don't see it. And so Jesus has to explain further. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? I mean, simply put, it comes in, it goes through, and it ends up in the toilet. It's a bodily function. It can't poison the heart is basically what he's saying. But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. And Jesus continues, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. He's saying our words, what comes out of our mouth, they are what defile us because they reveal what is in our hearts. It's kind of like a litmus test where you stick that bit of paper in a chemical and it comes out to a different color to tell you, is it acidic, is it alkali? You know, that is the litmus test, our words. They reveal what is in our hearts. And as we said in that confession earlier, we know that we have not loved God with our whole heart. And also we have not loved our neighbors well, as we love ourselves. And so that comes out and we see things like the hurtful gossip that reveals what you think about someone or the decisions you make that reveal maybe you care about your own comfort more than some of these other people around. Our hearts are the real problem, Jesus is saying. And they're not gonna be fixed by adding rules on top of rules. And so if I can make it a bit ridiculous for the moment, um, imagine God's law said, we aren't allowed to swim. We shouldn't swim. Okay, so that's fine. And God's people, they don't swim. Maybe someone makes the mistake and they, they go swimming in the lake. Um, maybe someone builds a secret pool in their garden. And so the, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, they say, well, let's add this extra rule, rule that no one should live, no one should have their house within five miles of a body of water. And that does help. It makes it harder for someone to go for an impromptu swim when they, they want to. The thing is, it doesn't really solve the problem. Because certainly if they lived in Leon on a day like today, um, like me, they probably will have the desire growing in them to go and jump in the nearest cool body of water, one of the many lakes around here, to cool themselves down. It hasn't changed their heart. They might say, okay, five miles is too far to go and walk to do that. But I still want to do it. So it hasn't solved the problem. It's kind of like you're painting the outside of your house, you're fixing up the window frames, but you step inside to find the stairs are only half there. There are exposed wires everywhere. It's just not fit to live in. That's kind of what's going on with these rules that mean it looks good on the outside, but the heart hasn't been sorted. And so Jesus is pretty damning of these extra rules. I mean, in verse 13, he says that they will be ripped up out of the ground, that every plant that isn't planted by God will be pulled up like a weed. So every kind of rule that isn't in God's word, well, that's going to be ripped up because it misses the point. 
and actually causes people to maybe even be distracted from considering their hearts and what's going on. In fact, they're so unhelpful. He says that the Pharisees are now like blind guides for the blind, not just useless, but even dangerous. that They might fall into a pit. Now, I think that tons of extra rules and for being super holy are not really as common in churches today. But this really applies not just to rules, but to kind of any of the outside trappings, the outside actions and things that maybe start to make us think we're okay, we're doing things all right. Now, as a church, maybe it's the need to be, to be trendy and not appear dated, um, to have music that's up to date. Or maybe it's activism and just having so much going on in the church calendar. Yeah, we must be doing okay. Or maybe it's having the best children's work. I mean, all of those things are good things. But if we think that a slick service is going to do more to bring someone to God than his spirit showing them Jesus as they hear his word, well, then we've fallen into the same trap. And we have become blind guides. Because that is not what changes hearts. And so let's not get caught up in these things. <laughs> okay. Okay. Show mercy to humble hearts. And if you're, if you're looking down the Bible with me, then that's verses 21 to 28. Jesus delights to show mercy to humble hearts. So Jesus, we read, he moves on from this place he's in and he travels quite some distance on foot. And he finds himself in Canaanite country, Tyre and Sidon, very much not a Jewish territory. And so if you look with me at verse 22, we see um, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. You can just imagine they're walking along. Maybe Jesus is talking to his disciples, maybe teaching them as he does. And suddenly there is this woman shouting at him, causing this, this racket. And 23 continues, Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away. And she keeps crying out after us. It is really surprising that Jesus says nothing. This is the only time he responds this way to anyone asking for healing. And the disciples, well, they just want Jesus to do something so she would go away. I mean, if the disciples were English, well, you'd probably be able to feel the embarrassment just coming off of them at this point. But the exchange that happens next, well, if you've read it before, it sounds a little harsh at first. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel probably talking to the disciples at this point. I mean, that is that the Jews and not the Canaanites is what he means. And the woman came and clearly she's still at a distance at this point, had been shouting and comes forward, kneels down before him and says, Lord, help me. And he replies, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Doesn't that sound a bit harsh? Now, just a, a, few, a couple of thoughts. It is probably a known saying. So he's not trying to call her a dog or something so obvious. But the focus of this little saying is that it's, you don't want to give the food to the dog so that the children don't have enough food to eat. You know, the children need food to eat. So you don't want to deprive them. And so in the same way, he's saying, I don't want to deprive Israel from what has been sent to them, God's blessing, God's saviour. So, but even with that, Jesus is silence, and then this exclusion, kind of saying, you are not, you're not one of the children. Wow. So maybe, maybe this is like that time that Jesus waited, and his friend Lazarus died. And Jesus said later, when he went to raise him to life, he said, basically, said, I waited so that you could see the Father's glory. Maybe something like that's happening, but we don't know. 
But the most helpful thing was uh, I read um, something written by another church pastor, and, and he said that the tone and look with which something is said makes all the difference. Even a thing which seems hard can be said with a disarming smile. So I'll leave you to decide um, what tone, what facial expression Jesus had as he read this. But maybe if, like me, you look at his character you see elsewhere, I can only imagine there is compassion and a kind of knowing look as he says these things. And so she responds, yes, it is, Lord. You're right. And then she says, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. So she's not offended at being told she's not one of the children in this image. Surprisingly, she agrees. She sees that she has no right to be at the table. And so asks only for the crumbs that fall. This woman clearly saw something of Jesus' greatness. She might not have seen at this point that he is God, but she certainly saw there was something great about him and that she was not worthy of it. And you see, this, this is the heart of being a Christian. Someone who understands they don't have a leg to stand on, that they have nothing to bring to God that he doesn't already have. They know their heart. They know they failed to love their neighbors as themselves. They know they have failed to love God as fully as they should. And so the Christian cries out for mercy as the Canaanite woman does. Um, and I read this, this story of a mother who once approached Napoleon, and I feel a little nervous that my first sermon on French soil, I'm including Napoleon in it, but um, she approaches Napoleon um, seeking a pardon for her son. And the emperor replied that the young man had committed this particular offense twice, and justice demanded death. But I don't ask for justice, the mother explained. I plead for mercy. But your son does not deserve mercy, Napoleon replied. Sir, the woman cried, it would not be mercy if he deserved it, and mercy is all I ask for. Well then, the emperor said, I will have mercy. And he spared the woman's son. None of us need or should want justice, because that is bad news for us, for all of us. But we all need mercy. And the wonderful news for the Canaanite woman and for all of us is that Jesus delights to give mercy. He delights to say yes to all that have the humility to see they need it and ask for it. And so in verse 28, Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted and, and her daughter was healed at that moment. This is the good news of Jesus. And if you're here today and you wouldn't yet call yourself a Christian, or maybe you just haven't been to church in years or were invited by a friend, this is what Christianity is. A bunch of broken people who make mistakes and simply depend on God's mercy. And then rejoice that he gives it willingly and freely. See, Christianity is not about all the things that you see Christians do. You don't have to start sorting out your life before you start following Jesus. Instead, Jesus says, follow me now as you are, and let's work on your life together. Instead, Jesus says, follow, I've written that twice. And no one can say I'm not good enough. How can God love me? Because that is entirely the point. Because for all who cry out for mercy, Jesus says, I take your sin and die for it on the cross. And instead, you take my righteousness and stand before God with that. And if, you, if that, this is you and you want to find out more about Christianity, then do speak to me after the service or Ben or whoever invited you. But many of us here have been Christians some time. And the struggle for us is that it is easy to forget our hearts, to forget that we depend on mercy day by day. I hear of many Christians who start following Jesus they're amazed by his gift of mercy. They see change in their life and their character. But over time, as they start to kind of talk the talk and walk the walk of whatever church they go to, well, it becomes just a habit. It becomes very normal. 
because all of the outside things start to look right. They look like how all the other Christians are living in that church. Maybe reading the Bible regularly. Maybe lots of kind of activism and supporting good causes. Maybe serving in the band. Even being a pastor. I mean, what looks more Christian than that? Because they look like a Christian, they stop noticing their hearts so much because it looks like things are all right on the outside. All the obvious sinful things are dealt with. And it's possible to start to forget how much we need God's mercy. And then you add on top of that what I was saying at the beginning. We live in this fast-paced society with constant information entering our eyes and our ears. There's never a moment's silence for us to notice our hearts. So I come back to the question I asked at the beginning. How mindful are you of your heart? When was the last time you stopped and reflected who you are, how you're doing, the struggles in your heart? Because when we do that, we will be reminded we depend on God's mercy. And this won't be a depressing thing to do, because we know that Jesus has promised to say, yes, we know he has already gone to the cross for all who cry out for mercy. And so instead, we can rejoice that Jesus delights. And the more we see our need for mercy, or the more we see his generosity and can rejoice all the more. And so, so brothers and sisters, let's fight the battle to not depend on our outside actions, but depend on mercy. And Trinity Church, I know I've only been here three weeks, but I know there are plans to try new things, to refresh old things, and try to make the most of the wonderful gifts that God has given so many of you. Um, the generosity we've experienced in our chaotic move here, the skills and talents I've started to see and hear about. But let's make sure as we go forward this year that we do everything knowing that God is the one who grows. And so let's depend on him. Let's be a prayerful church in the year to come. Let's rejoice in our merciful saviour in all we do. So let me close in a short prayer. Heavenly Father, all we have comes from you. Our life, our next breath. And we know that we have not loved you with all our hearts and that we don't love each other as we love ourselves. And so we thank you and we rejoice in the mercy that Jesus delights to give. Help us to remember that day by day and help us to be filled with joy because we have such a glorious Savior. And we pray in his name, trusting in the power of the Spirit working in each of us. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well done, Craig. Good job for your first sermon. Fair, fair alarm included in that. Well done. Yeah, I know um, Dave's second way is hot. There are children running around. I know that there's been a fire alarm. We've stood up, we've walked out the building, we've come back in. Uh, our heads are probably all over the place. But um, there were a couple of things that came to mind as uh, Craig was speaking. And um, I wonder if they're relevant for us. There was the, 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 Jesus, the moment of Jesus' silence. And I wondered if that was relevant for somebody here this morning who's just been praying to Jesus and all they've got is silence. I wonder if there's a woman who here has been rejected by people who blocked Jesus for her. I wonder if there's a woman here for whom she's gone towards, she wanted to get close to Jesus, but there are people who just stood in the way, whether it be in the church or things people have said. Or I wonder if there's a biologist, somebody who loves science and just goes, yeah, I want to believe with my heart, but I just can't get over the fact that my heart isn't really connected to my stomach directly, and there's a sort of a biological disconnect. I wonder if there's somebody who is sitting here this morning just going, yeah, I really don't bring anything to God. I'm just really not worthy of God's love for me. I'm not going to go on and on and on, but I wonder if those might contact or connect with people this morning. And it seems that all we can do is say, yes, Lord, please, Lord, come in, Lord. When we sing two songs and we can use those as a prayer to say, yes, Lord, come 
do your work in me. You're more powerful than I am. I want you to do that work in me. I welcome you. So let's stand and we're going to sing a couple of songs and let's make them our prayerful songs of invitation to the Lord Jesus. Let's go.